Welcome to the Startup Grind. I just want to thank you all for coming to Startup Grind. As uh, Paul was saying, some of you have been with us before. Some of you, this is the first time. But welcome, everyone. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Startup Grind and what we're going to do tonight. Um, Startup Grind is a global startup community. Uh, we are in 173 cities, and we are in 67 countries. Uh, and basically, we are designed to educate, inspire, and connect entrepreneurs. It's what we do. Uh, we love to do it um, because we want to make that startup journey a little less uh, lonely, um, a little more powerful. Uh, and so uh, all over the world, these events are taking place at different times during the month. We do have a global website, which is www.startupgrind.com backslash Albany. We'll take you to my website. But just the general um, dot com site will let you check out videos from all over the world, so depending on what you're interested in. Um, I got involved in Startup Grind uh, because I was um, in the corporate world, and I'd always done freelance things, um, but there was something that was missing for me. Um, and I finally realized last year that my job was just getting in the way of my life, so I needed to do something different. Um, went on the website and saw the Startup Grind, loved the values um, that they stand for and decided that this is something that I wanted to take part, of, take part in. So we've been doing this for about a year in the Albany area. Um, and um, this is like my favorite time of the month because I love to do these events. Um, I'm real excited. I'm, I'm always excited to be here. If you've seen me before, then you know I'm always um, basically excited anyway, but I'm always excited when we do these events. Um, but tonight I'm especially excited because um, we have a special guest who is coming all the way from London um, to be with us tonight and to share um, just some of the amazing things that are taking place in the small business world um, because this really is a global thing. Entrepreneurship is a huge global thing that's going on. Um, our guest is Richard Green and he is, his company is called Event. Uh, he's going to share from us uh, some things about how if you do events with, to promote events and give it a wider reach. But he's also going to talk about really kind of looking in the marketplace, identifying and recognizing a need and then um, creating a unique business to fill that gap. We have a tradition at Startup Grind, and I'm going to invite you all to join me in that to rest on your feet and help me give an all the new Startup Grind welcome to our guest, Richard Green. So, Richard. Hi. So, uh, just really glad again, just excited to have you. Um, you know, uh, always like to have a, a prep call with my guests so we can kind of do rapport building. Usually like to do those in face, but since you were across the pond, it was a little tough to get that handled. Um, my budget wasn't gonna let me do London at this time, this year, next year. Almost welcome. We'll, we'll try that, but um, just a, a really fascinating story that you have about how you built events and are just um, acquiring companies and expanding and integrating with other, you know, other global partnerships. So um, I like to start off a little bit, go back to the beginning and okay. um, Tell us a little bit about um, kind of how you started out. Um, you know, did you always know that you wanted to be a business owner? Were there people in your family that were entrepreneurs? How did uh, how did Richard get started? Well, he started out by buying a, a laptop on a, a young startup called eBay, and that's how I first started looking at the internet a bit more seriously from a, uh, a tech perspective. I ended up joining eBay in London. Spent three years of my career uh, within a corporate environment and uh, really it's an experience that you just don't forget. It was a quite transformational business uh, going from an American firm into a global business and um, I got a taste for a startup. eBay today is, is a huge organization but to me it's a startup company that I was part of and I left that company and continued with the companies that um, were startups, a company called Quipe went on to be bought by Yelp and um, it was whilst that quite Yelp that I discovered that there was an events proposition that was failing and that's how I started to look at events as a technology play that could be interesting from a new business perspective. So you, um, you started off and you had this experience uh, you know, in the corporate world. Um, you said something that was uh, really interesting um, that appealed to me as a entrepreneur in that um, when you talked about the transitioning, the three companies that you just mentioned, uh, when they reached a certain level, you were very intrigued and passionate about the startup stage, but as they became larger concerns, uh, what happened at that point? 
It's just the transformation from a startup to a corporate. In a startup, you have a decision in the morning and you're acting on it by the evening. Um, and as you become a bigger company, that day turns into a week, turns into a month. Um, at eBay, <coughs> decisions that I wanted uh, took a little bit too long to get the response from, and you know you start to become a little bit ineffective. There's a transitional piece between startups and corporates, and the middle bit I always just didn't enjoy. So you have the option of either working through that process and becoming part of a corporate machine. I probably I have friends today who are in very nice roles at Facebook and Google, um, but it just wasn't for me. I just I do love the culture that sits behind a startup. I love the challenges of a startup. And I'd been through three, four companies um, that did really well. And, I, you know, you get the confidence and the aspiration to do that for yourself. And then, you, you know, when you begin that journey, there is a huge amount of challenges that you are, that you face. So, you know, you either go back and get that corporate job or you, 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 you take on that role. You know, you decide that entrepreneurship is for you and you, you pick up the, the mantle and you, you figure out, you, you structure out your, your plan, you start to build that plan. So before we go any further into the conversation, um, because of your experience, we could go a lot of different ways. I just wanted to check with the audience, check with the audience and kind of get a sense of where we are. I know that we have some students. So if you're a student, if you just raise your hand, just kind of let us know how many, just kind of sense of um, the demographics. Uh, if you are someone that um, wants to start a business, as I call it a wannabe, you haven't quite started your business yet, you have some ideas. Could you raise your hand and let us know you haven't quite got your business? Okay, that's awesome. If you've already started your business, but you're still very early in that process, could you give us, uh, okay, fantastic. And if you have a senior business, a mature business, um, you know, your business is in place. Okay, great. Just so, just trying to get a, an idea as we're talking of, of kind of where to direct the conversation to. So that's awesome. Um, so, you know, what was it that let you know uh, you, you, you actually weren't in the event space in these other companies that you were in, no. but you, um, one of the ways of successfully becoming an entrepreneur is to identify something that's missing. Um, you know, they say the best way to start a new company is to invent something original that's not there, um, or to make something that's existing better. And so it sounds like you did a bit of both of those. So if we could talk a little bit about how do you recognize a, a, a gap in the marketplace and, and speak to that. Well, anybody in the room that's thinking of running their own business will firstly wake up in the middle of the night uh, with an idea and then you Google it and it's been done. So that's, that's your worst case scenario every day. Um, and there's definitely, there's definitely a need to go through a corporate environment, I think, to learn, to get the feel of what you, what you can do in the space. But I think specifically as you start to experience the, the business world and for me the technology business world, I started to come across problems with companies that had investment and funding and people, phenomenal people. And with that, you, you, you grow out solutions. Some companies have the idea and it works. Some people don't have the idea. They have something that doesn't work, but they grow beyond <coughs> that and build a business from, from learning. I think for me specifically, I'd spent around 12 years in corporate environments, and it was whilst that quite Yelp that I really learned a lot about um, businesses that were struggling to succeed with a product that I believed in. So Quipe Yelp have a phenomenal business product that they sell to SMEs, to small to medium enterprise businesses. But there was, a, there was an organization, there was a whole industry within, within Yelp that wasn't getting any success from the Yelp product. And that was the events industry. When you called a nightclub or an arts gallery or a theater, uh, when you spoke to a conference venue, they, they didn't want to buy a Yelp listing. They wanted help with the event. They wanted a, a product that helped the theater event schedule, uh, the comedy nights. They wanted help there. And I, and I joined Quipe, which is the European kind of copycat of Yelp that was bought for, uh, by Yelp uh, two years ago for around $50 million. Um, I worked for that company, and my job was to produce products to sell at the business level. And then we took them to market. And those products were turning over $1.5, $1.6 million per month in revenue. But we couldn't get anything into the events market successfully. And that bothered me. I'll be honest. That, that's, that's the kind of thing that gives me sleep, sleepless nights. Um, and I, I really wanted to try and find a solution to that problem. Um, I left that organization uh, and I started, I started work with a very, very small startup in uh, Silicon Roundabout in London. 
uh, and they were committed to trying to produce a product for an event organiser to make an event successful. And they were trying to bring everything together. They were trying email and SMS and uh, social. Uh, and they were trying lots of different things. But it really, when it comes to building a product from the bottom up, I think, for me, it's about finding the, the core of problem. Understanding and working specifically with the stakeholders, in this instance was promoters and venue owners in the events industry, and trying to really understand what is their habitual process, what do they do every day, what is the thing that makes their events successful, or what they believe is that method. And then as a, as, a, as, a, as a tech guy trying to figure out how to produce something that can replicate that manual process and technically deliver back a solution that saves time, saves money, and works. And for me, that's a big deal. Uh, eBay, the product, was amazing, which is why you all know of eBay. Uh, Yelp is a very, very good product, which is the why you know of Yelp. So, again, for me, the product has to work. It has to work for the stakeholders. In this instance, it was the venue owners, the promoters, the events industry. But also within that, uh, the business we built, which was events today, it, it required media owners as well. So we've had to really do a lot of work with companies like CBS Local, Eventful, Google Events, Facebook Events. We've really had to extend our work with publishers because they're part of this, the story. Um, but none of our stakeholders really knew they had a problem. So we've had to create a product and explain the problem and take to market. So there's been a lot of challenges. There's always challenges. You know, when you're inventing the wheel, someone probably likes square. So it's like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's tough. So um, you said earlier that you wake up in the middle of the night, you've got this idea, and I think everyone in this room has had that experience where you're like, oh, you know, you're kind of thinking of it, and maybe you Google it. Um, and so you Google it, and either you find that it's something that is already existing, or it's not, and then you get a little bit excited. Yeah. But as a, a, a beginner, how do you then translate that? Like, how do you figure out what the next steps are? How do you go from an idea, which is great, but ideas don't bring in, they don't bring home the bacon. How do you go from, uh, as, a, as a perhaps a new person, how do you make that transition from, how do you test the idea to see if it has merit? Well, I can, I can fast track you to six months after your idea and you're sat at home thinking, was this a good idea? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've had this great idea and nobody else is doing it. It's unique globally and it's six months in and you know, you're starting to put a lot of money and time and effort and people are saying, are you sure this is going to work? And you're going... Hmm, I don't know, actually. This is, is this, was this a good idea? Um, for me, I had an email. I had an email from LinkedIn, and it told me about a company called Yext out of New York. And they just raised $27 million to do what we did, but in the local space. It's a Yelp accelerator. They do multiple listing sites from one place. And I thought, oh, thank, thank you. Um, someone has clarified that what we do in our industry, there's no one in our space of events, but there's someone in uh, businesses. There's also another company in LA doing z uh, recruitment, Zip Recruiter, just raised 56 million investment on a Series A, which is their first raise. So validation was really important. Um, but I'm still back at <coughs> six months in, so I'm, I'm not there yet. But um, the point being is, at the very beginning, and I spoke to Bob a little bit at lunch about this, at the very beginning, it's about it's about the idea and validating that it's a good idea. And to do that, you have to put people around you, like real people, people that believe your idea. If you've got people around you that don't believe in what you believe in, move them away, because that's the first thing. You, you have to build an, uh, uh, warriors. You have to build uh, people around you that believe and will fight for that idea with you as much as you believe in it. And then the next stakeholder is the client. Um, a lot of companies that I see today, and I'm not, my, my route's my route. It's, 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 everyone has a different route to market. Um, but in my opinion, you, you have to have customers who believe in the products and who are willing to pay for what you do. There's a, I see so many business plans which take 12 and 24 months. They build a product and they don't really know who their customer is. Um, when they've built it and they take it to market, they wonder why no one buys it. And then the other, the other kind of startup is where they build freemiums and they give it away to everybody for free and then they don't know how to commercialize it and they run out of money. For me, it was really important. I started the business with my own money. Um, no one would give me money. 
No one would give me any investment to start with because it was so it was so crazy. You know, it didn't exist. No one was doing it. So I, I put great people around me. I, I didn't I didn't stop believing in what I was doing except for that one time on you know that six months. But I was it was just a moment. Just a moment. Um, and I really I think the key to our success because we didn't have a huge amount of funding was we found customers. Those customers still use our product today, and we're nearly three years in. And we built a very small customer base that committed to invest in our business, both mentally and financially. Uh, even investors that I bring into our company today are investors, not just anybody. They're investors that believe in our business or come from the industry that we are invested in. I don't see venture capital investment as helpful as money that comes in or from clients that invest in our, in our business directly. So for me, the critical piece was people who around me and clients that were willing to invest both mentally and financially in our startup belief. Um, to give you an idea of how it started, our business was built on a Google, I literally produced our business in a Google, in a Google Excel document that I shared with a client once we did the service. You could almost class us as an agency uh, with a couple of people. Um, and just to put it into perspective where we are today, we're two and a half years old, very small. We turned over a million dollars in revenue. Uh, we have a team of 16 based out of London, uh, three offshore companies that, that service and support the business, and this year will hopefully come into the US. So it's, it can start from something as small as an Excel document in Google Docs that you share with your client, um, but you really have to keep focused on the, on the business, and you've got to keep driving forward on the focus. It's, but the people, it's, it's the people around me today that make my job um, as enjoyable as it is. <coughs> so... What I, I hear you saying is it's really important to build a team. Um, you know, the dream killers, you want to you wanna get those people out of your realm because it's already a mind game, just the thought of going out on your own and building your own endeavor. And I think I also heard you say that you had skin in the game. You know, you started off with your own investment. Very often I hear in talking to entrepreneurs that they're very interested in outside investors or, you know, VCs. Um, you know, if I had got my website... I, you know, I, admit, I put my website up, I'll get some business cards, and I'm pretty much ready to go, you know, ready to go into business. Um, but not really having thought through what is it yourself, and the skin in the game is not just financial, but it also is that thing that you talked about with that commitment as well. So how would you say um, you've got an idea, you think it's a pretty good idea, you've got some validation, you've validated it, yeah. So how are you then? To, how do you then go into that that next phase? You started off with the Google Doc. Yeah. So this is something that, um, and this kind of comes, you know, almost to the prototype question. Uh, how ready do you need to be um, before you go into the marketplace? How do you know? How do you know? I don't know. Maybe it's a combination of um, uh, constant investment in that process. Okay. Um, constant investment. Uh, keeping your eye out for critical validation points. There's no point just doing it because it can be done. It's got to be and done. How do you validate? Um, today, today the phone rings. That's an amazing thing. <laughs> That's an am that, you know you know sometimes it rings and it's just like wrong number. Right. That's not so great. But today the phone <laughs> rings. Um, someone emails you and they want you to to get in touch. You know people want to know about what you're doing. Um, Patrice from Albany calls you and asks you to get on a plane and, a, and an Amtrak and turn up and talk about it. There's, a, there's, an, there's an interest in what we are doing. Um, I absolutely believe that as, a, as an organization, we are trying to um, resolve, trying to fix up a, a real problem that exists in a community, in an events community, globally. I didn't know it was global until people from all over the world came to us. Um, I've got a, a team of 16 very passionate, very young, very passionate uh, people who also are committed to that process. Uh, we purchased a couple of companies in the early stages because one of them was amazing but was, was going to fail financially because they hadn't structured the business properly or well enough to su succeed in this very aggressive environment that is you know, tech startup world. Um, and we bought the market leader in the UK when they when they, they faltered. But it's validation points are all around you, all around you. 
Um, when your best friend throws you £10,000 because he wants to invest, that means he's either crazy, drunk, or uh, he believes in your business. Um, there's validation points every day. Every day. And I, I, you know, being here is a validation point. What about customers? How did you, or how can one, okay, I've got this idea, I've kind of validated, I think it is, and, and part of that validation must be the responses that you're getting, but customers, how do you know that you have the right target? Um, honesty and, and tolerance. If you're honest with your customers, um, they tolerate mistakes. Uh, if you have phenomenal and passionate staff, they deal with problems uh, exceptionally well. We listen. Uh, we really listen. If a customer thinks we're doing something wrong, we listen. And if that wrong is wrong for everyone, we correct it. If it's wrong for just them, maybe it's not as important as for everyone. Um, but we're very close to our customers. Like, we are super close to our customers. I do client visits. I went to um, one chap in... Because it's a cultural. There's a big cultural change everywhere that we work. Today we operate in 70 countries worldwide. We have only 3,500 customers. Uh, some of those customers are spending a lot of money with us today in the conferencing sector. Um, but I, you know, I, met a, I met a chap at a, a conference in Tel Aviv. He wanted to spend money and work with our organization. I had to fly to Tel Aviv again. He wouldn't do business till I ate dinner with him. So I ate dinner. It was a very nice dinner. Um, and I, I trained his entire, entire team of uh, 14 people. And that was a part of him believing in our business. If that's what it takes, that's what, that's what we do. Uh, I've got a guy that wants me to go and see him in Sydney, in Australia. I just can't wait to go. My <laughs> wife won't let me leave, but I just can't wait to visit Sydney. But um, uh, clients, whether they email you, text you, phone you, or want to see you, uh, it, isn't, it isn't just about our need to grow an organization. It's about their need for our product to help their organization. And if you get that right, if you get product and customer aligned, then the product becomes more accessible to people that don't need to ask you all those questions. Okay. The perfect client today is someone that can come into an event through, a, through the web, sign up, get it, just get it. They realize that this is going to be something that's going to market their event effectively. It's going to fill a room past the 30% that they get normally. And... Um, they can afford it. It's affordable. And they, they, once they get it and if they keep using it, um, then that's, that's really good news. We, and we have, there's some very, you know, we have very important metrics that we work to every day in the business. We have a 79% retention rate on customers. That's important. <laughs> Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Um, we, we have, you know, we have markers around how we operate. Price point's got to be right for people to buy. Retention's got to be right so that they stay in, and they keep using it. People have got to keep logging in. It, it's it's like a human being on the operating table. You 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 got to keep it. You got to keep the heart pumping, and everyone's got to be happy. You know, it's, it's technical, but it's it's doable. Talk about speed going to the marketplace, and uh, again coming back to the kind of the prototype question. Or you got the idea, you you validated, you got customers. That's a good sign. You got income coming in. Um, you put it out there. Your customers respond, you know, positively or negatively. How do you know? When you need to, you know, that when you've got that MVP, how do you know when you've got that uh, minimum viable product? Yeah. You know, I, I knew quite early. Um, I, I didn't spend a year, two years building a product in a, in a silo, in a, in a darkened room. Um, I knew we had a product the day we, we, we had a client. Right. And I, I knew we had a product... When we launched the, 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 the real thing, when we, when we moved away from Google Docs, which is really a horrible starting point, I can tell you as, a, as a, a technology person, it's like the worst thing to build is someone else's platform is, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a as a substitute, really. Mm -hmm. when, we, we, when we dropped $50,000 on our MVP, um, which is tough to do, because I could have bought a nice car on my, you know, something else, something more, more normal. Okay. Um, we built a little app, and... Um, when we gave that to customers, and they loved it, and they used it, um, I think the biggest validation of our, our, our minimum viable product is when it just went global. So today, you know, people are using this app in, uh, in Dallas, in San Francisco, in India, in Sydney, Australia, in Israel, in Germany. 
Um, when people are using it, you expect them to use it in your local environment of Albany if you launch an Albany app. If you're launching in the US, you expect a US exposure. Um, for me, I've always worked in international companies, and as much as I was told not to focus on international activity, I didn't, and they came because the right. product was relevant right. globally. So that was really That's, exciting for me, that was personally. The question. How did you make that transition from national to global? But it sounds as if it came to you. It's down to uh, one of our investors today. Um, James White was the global marketing director for a conferencing firm in London called IQPC. He now works for UBM, operates out of Santa Monica and all over the US. We built this product not for conferencing. We built it for local. We built it for comedy clubs, live music. We built it for the local. I'm all about trying to help the little guy. Um, this would work for a live music venue in Albany today. And a James White from a very big conferencing company said, can you do this for us in conference? Because I've got five people over here spending $350,000 a year who are manually putting events onto media sites because we need to market our event. And he said, can you build me this in the conferencing space? And I went, sure. And the moment we did that, the conferencing space isn't local. Um, conference organizers are operating conferences, exhibitions, and training courses globally. Uh, and the moment we sold into that, 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 that sector, it, we, we in, it immediately had an international, an international focus. It, it, it occurs to me that I, I never really even shared what it is that your company actually does. So that probably would be helpful for you guys to know what it is. Yeah, um, events. Yeah, it, uh, we uh, our our application is really simple. Um, a million events are submitted onto Facebook every month into the little section. For the same time, it would take you to add your event to Facebook. You can log into Events, the app, submit your event to us once, and we submit to all relevant listing sites for that event. So, in New York. Uh, if you were putting an event into our application, you'd be on about 87 event listing sites, ranging from uh, associations, social, local, national, global, and industry-specific to comedy, live music. It's a very, very simple way of getting your event on listing sites, radio sites, social media sites, TV, media platforms, uh, and the audience reach is anywhere between 40 and 100 million event consumers that are on those channels every month. 30% of the sites we work with have a mobile app, which means the, the content's not only on Facebook, but it's on your mobile phone as well. Um, and the news really is when you place uh, a piece of new content against uh, a location like Albany, Comedy Night in Albany, and you place so much content on so many sites so quickly, Google just loves that, just takes over. Um, and on average, we get between 30 and 70% first page of Google, pages two, three, four, and five for content. It's similar to the Yelp model of content is king from reviews and photos and so forth. We do something similar with events. So it's an events marketing product for an event organizer. And it's super affordable compared to what you would cost if you were doing it through an agency. You mentioned um, that you acquired some companies. Um, so when, when do you know that it's, it was almost like a, a need? You needed some things. You. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of speed to the marketplace um, because sometimes it seems um, it, it seems as if if you take your time and you're very reasoned, um, but sometimes you can run out of resources. So talk about the importance of speed to the marketplace. Well, I've I've been brought up with an inherent fear. Um, I work for an I've, I've worked for American companies. I'm based out of London and Germany love to copy. So, if you're too, you're, it's always the case. Quipe was a German copy of Yelp. Um, there was a company that eBay purchased, I forget the name of it, that was the copy of eBay. So I have an inherent, I'm, I'm, I'm now born with an inherent fear of copycats. So my need to be putting events into market at speed is, is almost like an ongoing pressure. Um, for someone to copy our product, uh, in terms of the message, the website, it's probably half an hour after this show. You, know, you, can, you can leave here today and go and replicate the website and produce it. Um, and that's quite scary. Anyone putting a business on the web today, you can copy it pretty quick. So how do you differentiate your business? Well, it, it's down to the basics. I don't think technology businesses are any different to the businesses that we have uh, on the street. It requires having integrity, 
you've got to be in, in game longer than most. We've been in business three years now. Two years is usually the failure rate. Two years in. Got to get past two years. You need a good customer base. Customers that are loyal. And they, people are. If, if you do a good job, they normally stay. But speed to market is, is pretty critical. We've, we're, this, this kind of uh, audience creates um, a, br a global awareness. So I know, I know that people are looking at our business. Um, and I know the moment we start to hit revenue numbers and that starts to become public, that'll become a little bit more interesting in the US market. But that's the game. You know, um, we're ahead of that curve. And from a strategic perspective, we've inherently built within our business uh, layers of IP um, and infrastructure that make uh, people following us. It's, look, it's, it's harder to, to, to come behind. I, because I, I'm just... I'm, I'm, the Germans, they're always copying stuff. They're always copying. You lived in Germany, you know, so I can, I can, be, I can say this. But, um, they, they copy quick. They copy quick. So, you, yeah, you have to be careful, you know. I don't know how Starbucks and Costa Coffee and... and there's a, in, in London, you have, like, five coffee shops on the same street. I don't know how they exist, you know. Wouldn't it be great? If we can retain a, a control on markets being the primary in terms of doing a great job for as long as possible, that'd be, that's, that's my ambition right now. And we do that through best-in-class products. I believe if we produce the best in class product and we get that to market, I haven't spent a penny on marketing in two and a half years. Um, our business has grown through recommendations and referrals. And that, and that is something I'm very proud of. Okay, that sounds great. Um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I know that you said that your validation came because your customers and the, and the dollars came in, so you had customers. Yeah. But how? So you didn't spend money on marketing, but your first round of who those customers were, how did you identify? Because that's, that's an important thing for a new entrepreneur. The worst thing you can do is to have the wrong, to, well, it's not the worst thing. One of the uh, least helpful things is to not, to be aiming at a target audience that is not the correct one for your business. And um, empty bank account could be some indicator of that. But how do you, um, how do you do that? How do you identify who that first set of, customers are we're really lucky uh, my customer is is just so obvious it's so obvious like if you think about Yelp's customer it's every business owner everywhere and in there's probably the right kind of customer that will buy from them but who do you speak to first and their audience is kind of restaurants eventually because people write reviews good and bad and then they have to pick up on that and they sell the positive marketing solution against a restaurant so for Yelp as a business it's huge. Who do you start with? It's, it's, you've got to make a decision. For us, it's really simple. I am looking for, if you think about who this person is, it's so obvious. I'm looking for someone, um, or a, a, a person or a venue that is running an event. So if they're running events, I want to know if they're, uh, if they're interested in trying to market the event. Ideally, they'll be putting events onto listing sites. And if that event comes with a price point, it means that they're commercially interested or incentivized to promote it. So every single person that's using Eventbrite, anyone that's running an event, going on a computer, filling out an events listing, and telling the world that it costs nothing, or it costs $5,000 to attend, there's my customer base. Uh, interestingly, Eventbrite is a company that doesn't do a great job of marketing your event, they just provide the, the system of registration and ticketing. Right, right. So who, who's my customer? There's 5,436 media publishers globally taking event listings. Facebook take one million. Every single person putting an event on the web today is a potential customer. And that, doesn't, that sounds big, but it's not as big as Yelp's problem, trying to figure out everyone in the US. So anyone that's incentivized, who's willing to submit an event and put it live, the moment that goes on the web, my job is to figure out who that person is, where they are, and I've got, I, I just got to get to them and explain to them that what they're doing isn't one of the best uses of their time. You can, if you want, do that on, the, on Eventbrite and on Facebook and on Time Out. You can go and do that if you want, but you can not do that and do something really smart. There's something smart is to give us it once, relax, have a coffee, and let us do with the rest of the work. So... Our target audience is really easy to identify. Even easier if you think about conferences. Every conference is an event and 
someone somewhere is doing a lot of hard work to market it and they don't need to. So we, it's just how we communicate with them that's the, the tricky piece. And that's just been from the beginning. You've, it, it seems like you have a really clear idea. Um, it kind of disclosed itself by the nature of your business, which is, again, coming to you saw that need that things were getting done, but they weren't being done in, a, in an efficient way. Yeah. And your, um, your company provides a way to do something better. An average local venue is putting anywhere between three and four events on a week. Like even the worst, even restaurants, they have uh, 12 to 15 a year. Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, they, you know, ev everything can be an event. Um, identifying a local business that has three to four a week events that are happening and understanding the pain they go through just to market that one event, forget it. Trying to do 20 events a month is, is almost... An average event organizer locally will place their event if they're, if they're into in online marketing onto between eight and ten listing sites. Uh, we have a freemium product that places an event on ten listing sites for free. Why, so why spend three hours when you can sure. do it for free? Sure. So it's, I think the, the tricky point with our business is we have identified a problem. We've produced a solution. The world just doesn't know they have the problem yet. They're kind of still there going, okay, well, this is, this is, this is what I have to do. The conferencing side of our business knew that it was a problem, and they looked for a solution, and they found us. Mm -hmm. And that, that has been a success in our business because it's funded our growth. If it hadn't have been for the conferencing business finding us, and if it hadn't have been for the financial, um, the financial contribution from that investor, that client, um, we would have struggled to exist as a, as a business because you can't have an idea for three years. Right. You've got to have a business within six months if you want to have a business in three years. So okay. uh, it's, it's the conferencing business that's, that's, done us, that's done us the most amount of work. But I, again, we're about to, we're about to turn the ship uh, and come back towards the, the local businesses because that's where the problem is and that's the pain. Um, you know, that's, that's, where I, that's where my passion is. I, I, I'm not trying to help conferences per se, although we do a lovely job for them and I love them very much for their... For their, for their contribution to our business, but it's the local event organizers. Um, they're going through so much pain right now. And they're, the events aren't as full as they should be. And if you think about it, the real problem is uh, everybody, if I was to ask you now to go and to tell me about or go and look at what events are on right now in Albany, you probably wouldn't know. Even if you chose one of the many apps on the planet today to find them, they don't have the best events information. The person that's probably got the best informa events information is probably the person sat next to you that's aware of something that's going on. If we could enable venue owners to get their events on the web at this, at this level, you just need to go to Google and search and you'd have the answer. So it, I still have a big passion to get back to local. My, my, you know, eBay for me was local businesses. Um, quite Yelp is local. I got dragged into corporate a little bit with conferencing, uh, I'll, but I'm on my way back to local. I really want to fix the local events problem. I want to talk a bit about partnerships because I know that you, again, you've, you've bought some companies um, and you have um, some, an exciting recent integration with Eventbrite. So how do you know when it's time to take on a partner? Yeah, partnerships. So I'll, I'll make a confessional. The, the first company we bought, um, I'd had too much wine and uh, I'd, I, I sat with a, um, a founder in London. Uh, and he had some problems and I loved what he was doing and we eventually, over a very short amount of time, came to the conclusion that we'd be better together. And we, we acquired that company. Event is the brawn of marketing, but he had a product called Event Sneaker, which was the brains. So all the analytics and the conversions. So I thought that was a great partnership. Brains and brawn, great partnership. Um, in terms of partnerships, partnerships can kill you. Um, you build a great product and you sit yourself out in the wind waiting for a great partner that you want to work with, that they want to work with you to make to sign the paperwork, it can kill you. Because great partners, it doesn't happen overnight. It can take days, weeks. Um, one of the biggest partnerships I did while I was at Quipe, it took me two companies. I, I was trying to do the deal at the previous company. It took me nearly four years to do one partnership. So partnerships are really tricky. I've been trying to do partnerships for three years, but I haven't depended on partnerships. Um, but if you get the right partner, like in, any, in anything in life, if you get the right 
Batman and Robin. If you get the right partnership working, you really can be a lot more like dynamic. Um, we have this year an absolute focus. Now we have a financial stability in terms of our uh, business to market and a client base that we have a good retention with. This year for me, my primary job is partnerships. We signed 13 partners in the first four weeks of this year. The 13th, being my lucky number, uh, it was Eventbrite. Uh, probably the biggest partnership, probably the big, biggest partnership deal that we'll do this year, which is quite, which is quite exciting. Very exciting for it to be this early in the year. Very yeah. exciting indeed. So, um, you started. Your heart is for local event producers, um, and yet almost of its own volition, you found yourself uh, operating in a global fashion. Um, Two-part question. Is, was that that just happened because of a need? Or I guess the question I really want to ask is, how do you determine when it's time to move into a global market and how do you retain your local culture? Yeah, we, you, I, I, can, I can tell you now, nine times out of ten, you should not be in a global market straight away. Um, no one recommends it. Um, it, isn't, it isn't fun doing it. Um, the, the, the job is the job is to own. If you were launching a local product here today, you'd, you'd be focusing on Albany. If you can crack it in Albany, you could probably get other states. And if you can get other states, you go countrywide. And everyone will always tell you it's always country specific. It's just all of it, that's the focus. That's every book and everyone I talk to is that's the story. Um, I think it's probably the simplicity of our product. It, it comes with its challenges. Things that you'll never, you, you know, they're just. They're almost coming at the side. You know, we sell to clients in China. The product, the, the product by, uh, by default gives phenomenal marketing in Google. Well, Google's restricted in China. So um, that makes it difficult for our product to work in China. Um, someone signs up in Russia. And my guys aren't so good at understanding Russian. So uh, customer service can be an issue. So international's tough. You have to understand that um, your local market's huge. Your local market by country is huge. And if you don't need to step out of it, my advice would be don't step out of it until, until you strategically choose to. I didn't choose to. It just, it just happened. And I kind of let it. But I, 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 it's, it, it just happened in, for us. And, and if you think about it, it's almost like um, you know, a, a very s a thin layer of butter on toast. I, we might have gone international. We have an MVP that's working international. But in no way have I managed to deep dive in those local markets. Um, the first one will be the US through the Eventbrite relationship, hopefully with the integration with Eventbrite, accessing their customer base, providing our marketing tool at Freemium, which was built for the Eventbrite integration, um, and also as part of the, uh, the news that's coming uh, in March, we'll see a bigger access to that audience. Um, and the U.S. market is obviously a huge market for us to, to, to look at. Um, but again, I, I, I wouldn't suggest anyone just produce something for an international market straight away. It's, it's tricky. Even payment. Payment's a nightmare. And taxes and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So you're, you're talking about um, freemium products, and I want to make sure that um, some of our newer entrepreneurs have an, have an understanding. So you can, um, different schools of thought, that you offer a certain amount of things uh, free, um, that I, I know, especially like in a coaching modality, sometimes it's you know there's a certain amount that we're going to provide free, yeah. uh, and it's a it's a value. It only works if it's a valuable product, um, and then with the hope that that interest is there, and then there's going to become a, a a paying customer. But the freemium is something different. Uh, talk about that. Freemium is it's pretty it's a product that works that's good that you don't pay for it's it's kind of like the guys outside Starbucks giving you little shots they don't you know it's nice but they want you in the shop to buy obviously we want you in the shop to buy um, I'm at a a very firm position day one that because we were a small organization with a small amount of staff with a very thin piece of technology in place uh, that we could not support customers that weren't willing to contribute into our business if they can't contribute financially, then I can't contribute financially to support them. And I, and I think that's really important. If you're producing a business relationship with somebody, there has to be, like the entire conference industry last year wanted to give us a stand 
at their event for free if you, we could, they could have our product for free. I want to be on the. I want to be at Confex with a stand. I want to be at all of these events with a stand. But I don't exist if I don't have money to pay salaries, and that's part of me prioritizing my team and my product over over just giveaways and free. So I personally, as as, an, as a business owner, have decided that freemium wasn't right for us at the beginning. Whereas some companies go to market with free straight away. Um, the companies that probably have big VC investment, that have got a huge money in the bank. Um, Uber, free taxis. One billion, pan, one billion dollar investment today. Um, free taxis. I, I just couldn't, I wasn't in a position to do that as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. So we stayed focused on premium. Produce something that, you, that we were able to sell. Customers that bought it thought that was worth what we paid for it. And we built that model. Uh, it's slower though. Um, if you think my numbers today, million dollars in revenue, 3,300 customers, 79% retention rate, small team of people, every single person touching my app, every single person, every customer and every employee, everything's just, everyone's invested, everyone's invested, it's all just getting better and better and better and it's, every day it's just getting better. Tomorrow, I launch Freemium. And I give it to Eventbrite, who are doing 300,000 events a month. Now I've got, say, 200,000 customers using the platform for free who don't care, who have questions, who, um, who just want something for free. You know the difference between a free, sure. nothing's free. Sure. If someone gives you a, a dollar, the relationship's better. If someone takes it for free, the relationship's not as good. So, but freemium for me is a really interesting... I'm buying into freemium as a, as a product because I believe that 200, 300,000 people at Eventbrite don't yet know a better way to market their event. I believe if I give them that little smoothie and fudge bar taster outside the shop, I believe if they just try it, they'll buy into our ethos. I believe if they um, use the application and, and I can get them onto 10 listing sites and show them the value, I believe they'll become customers. I believe that. I don't think I believed that two years ago because my product was so new to market. But three years of working with the product and with the clients, um, I, have this, I have this bigger belief than I had in, in, in three years ago. I have a really, we really have a good product. So go wild. Try, try the taster and let me know. And, let, and if it isn't as good as it needs to be, we'll, we'll keep making it better. But we, we invested heavily into the Eventbrite integration. We can now do a lot of things for Eventbrite customers. They don't, well, they don't even have to do anything other than click, connect, draw the events, and then we push them out. There's nothing more to do. Sure. Um, if that's good news for Eventbrite customers, then they'll, sure. co they'll come. Then you'll see that. We'll, yeah, hopefully. You also talked about investment. Mm. And that was another question that I had. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, a tricky horse to ride, uh, outside investment. So it's, the question is, you know, do you need it, and when? How do you determine um, that that outside investment is a is the right choice for your company? Investment is so tricky. It's it starts off by you looking at your 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 family and friends and thinking, hmm, would they give me money? And then you think, well, they probably won't give you money if it fails. If it fails, you'll not see Christmas presents ever again. So um, um, I, I I declined any. Uh, family investment, but that's again. This is just my route. I just don't. I don't think there's always there's not a right and wrong with anything, really. It's just the choices that you make as an individual around your business. I personally uh, self-funded. I consulted, and I, you know, stole, beg, and borrowed uh, until I knew there was a tipping point where I felt this is this is this has got legs. Um, once I knew that. I then realized that the business didn't have enough air, and air for a business's investment is funding. Um, so we took funding, and, and it gear changed. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the business gear changed. We, had, we hired sales staff. We hired a marketing person. We hired uh, client service staff. It's like really basic stuff, but uh, we, we, we built some technology. That was quite nice. Um, and then you realize that with a bit more money, you could gear change again. And it, 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 you've just got to be careful. Like, the problem with the investors is they want to give you money and take your company. But that's the game. But you just, you've just got to be careful how much of you, you give away. You know, they're taking a bit of your soul. You know, they're taking a little bit of your soul. 
So investment's critical. It's critical for, for growth. Uber took $1 billion today to grow, and they took it on, probably on their own terms, um, and it'll be good for their business. But you have to just make sure that you really have the right people around you when you're taking money. Um, the person you're taking the money from is not the person to ask if the deal's good. You need to speak to an advisor, take proper legal advice. You need to get the right consultation. Um, and money investment can be good. I'm in New York right now, um, and it's, it's, it's tough. Um, I've met with three venture capitals this week. One told me that I have to have a million a month in revenue for him even to see him again. Okay, fine. Uh, another firm uh, has an expensive coffee. Um, um, another chap, uh, his opening investment was 40, is 40 to 100, 100 million. He did five investments last year. Smart guy, Bain Capital. Super smart guy, Matt. Um, but do you know what's interesting? If you're interested in investment, go and see everyone because I get told off for speaking to everyone. But um, if you've never raised money before, go and speak to people that are willing to lend you money and learn it. It's like I get schooled. I got, this week I got schooled in New York. Um, <laughs> Bain Capital. Um, he, he, he was great. He really was helpful. Uh, Bessemer Ventures. Uh, that was an expensive coffee, but he's introducing me to five investors that are probably more suitable to our size of business. We're all different sizes, you know. Um, but investment's not bad. You just got to be careful. You know, no one, no one gives you money for free. Um, you just got to be careful where you get it from. Okay. I'm still learning now. I'll come back to you when I when okay. I when, they, when they when they when they give me the money. I'll come back yeah. to you. <laughs> Actually, when you give me the money. I'll fly to London and we can do the show. Right? Sure. Um, I wanted to leave time for questions. Uh, I wanted to give folks an opportunity to ask questions. So, um, was there any questions in the audience? Right. Uh, there are, Hi. in my experience, there are events and there are events. This is an event. Paul, excuse me. Can you just use that mic right back there just so we can record? We can get the questions. Thank oh, you. Yeah, much. Gotta... Something new. Sorry, folks. Gotta stand to the mic. Thanks so much. What I was starting to say, and I hope everybody could hear me, um, you know, my experience, there are events and there are events. This is an event. I've done a lot of civic events. I've also tried my hand, somewhat unsuccessfully, at a grander event, such as the Hudson Champlain 400, the 400th anniversary of Henry Hudson coming up the Hudson River and, and stopping where Albany is now, which was massive, potentially. <laughs> and yep. it was more massive for, uh, I can't think of the name of it, I don't want to think of the name of it. The, uh, the other 400 in Virginia that took place a couple of years before. Um, have you thought of scale? Uh, I'm sure you have thought of scale. I mean, you know, there's the Olympics, and again, there is a, a you know a band or a, a club or this that and the other thing. Um, can you do both? Can you, you know, what do you do for, uh, to to evaluate scale? I, I had this conversation a little bit uh, at lunch today. Um, it's, it's a tough one to answer. Um, every event, it doesn't matter whether it's a charity event, it doesn't matter whether it's an Olympic event, you don't want it empty. So attendees, more attendees is critical. My experience in the conferencing market has given me some really phenomenal insight with some serious global professionals on how to market an event. And I believe that we can bring that experience and that expertise with some very easy technical layering of things like email and SMS and social so that an event organizer that's running an event in Albany can have the same experience as what you would get from a, an agency level product. It's going to take me some time to build that, but I've got the idea, I've got the vision on that. In terms of um, the conferencing market, a good conference has 60% on average returning customers every year, a bad one around 30%. So that even the good ones have this gap. So I only have a couple of customers I don't sell to. If you're running a private event, if Patrice is having a birthday party, uh, she doesn't want to use event because she doesn't want anyone that she doesn't know there. So private events don't work fundamentally. Um, secondly, if an event organizer's full, they don't need event marketing again. So there is people that don't need event marketing. But for me, if you think about the principles of good event marketing, 
And if you forget, forget my business, if you think about the principles of good event marketing, it's about getting really high quality information about the event that you have, the location it is, the price that it costs, the people that are speaking, and the location it's based. It's about getting that information out to the, to the largest audience. The largest audience today of people that are interested in, in events are on event listing sites looking for things to go and do. They're on mobile apps looking for things to go and do. So if your event is not there, you've got a problem. If it is there, you've, you've ticked a big box. If the content being on those sites distributes super effectively into organic search, then you're available to be found on Google. Now, 87% in the UK market, 87% of people start their web journey at Google. My mum, she goes to Facebook. She goes to Google to get there. She knows she's going to Facebook, but she goes to Google to get there. So we know that we're trained to go via Google. So secondly, if, if your event is available in Google, then that's good news. If your event, if people aren't looking for the event, or they just don't like the event that you're running, the best event marketing in the world can't help you. If you've got a good event, it's well distributed, it's available in the right channels, it's in organic search, it's on mobile. If there's an audience for that, and if someone says they're going to go and they talk about it and they look to find out where it is that they're going and they find it on Google or on this site, you're going to increase the amount of people that go. I think the logic around us getting people to the event is, is, is on, on the money, but it does require great content at the beginning coming in. It does require that the event is a good event, and it's an, it's a, it's an interesting an event, and you, you kind of have to have people looking for it. So um, I, I have the belief, people, I get asked this all the time from clients, is, will, will this work for me? Do you know something I couldn't tell you? The event that I get today, every event I get is new. The experience that it has on the web is absolutely unique to the itself, and that same event next year could be absolutely different. But... I do believe that the disciplines that we have in place against making that event effective are the best it could be. The only tiers of activity, I think, that would make it better, which we'll, we're building, is how do we capture the people that go via a ticket purchase, turn that into an email that we send to those people to let them know that it's on again. A bit more personable because they've done this before. If someone is saying they're buying an event, they're coming to an event and they buy a ticket, maybe texting them to tell them that there's the address, so if, if they didn't turn up, that you make sure you get them there. So I think the disciplines are right, um, and I think it, it is effective, uh, but sometimes events aren't, as, just sometimes people just aren't wanting to go. Maybe that's some of the issues, but I think the disciplines are right. So I have a few questions, and okay. some of them you've already briefly touched, but more specifically, I wanted to go back to when you first started the business, okay. and then how you initially got your first customers, and as well as how you tested your product with those customers, and really got a beta testing down to know that, okay, these are the things that we need to change, these are the things that are good and need to stay and improve upon. I just want to know at the early stages how you went about that. So... I left um, a corporate, I was working as global partnerships for quite, and I left that company, it was getting a bit too corporate. So I went to join a startup company um, in the event space, and they were specifically, so I went and joined a, basically a startup that was, doing, that was working in the event space that were trying to fix a problem, and they went down a totally different route. And oddly, the, the customers that were buying their product, in my opinion, didn't want them to go down that route, they were really interested in this core proposition. So, uh, from, from in my story, when I left that company, I just focused on this one piece of this product and said, right, this is, this is what I think everybody wants and this is what I'm going to focus on. In terms of customers, I actually contacted key customers. It's really easy for me because I'm like, Jonglers was one of our first accounts. Jonglers is 16 venues in the United Kingdom. They do comedy and they are never full. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's, it's not as full as it should be. So I, I, I basically had a, a, I picked out a list of potential customers. So you pick your top 10, top 20 customers that should use your product. You call them. And you don't call the executive, you call the CEO. Uh, you get an appointment and you go and do an interview. And you go and meet the, the guy and you talk to him about his business. And you talk to him about what you're trying to achieve. And if, if you've got a good relationship in the meeting, 
you, you, you ask him to commit to a three-month contract and say, listen, I want to basically work on delivering you a value proposition that we think is going to help your business. The guy's got to be crazy. You know, if, you've, if you've got a good product and you're sat with the right guy and you're having a, um, a, a good conversation about how you can help each other, a three-month contract is just enough time for you to get to know him and for him to get to know you. And if you've got a good relationship, even if you're not great at your, at your product, he'll, he'll, give you more, he'll give you more runway. Jonglers is, is, is a company that's been with us now for two and a half years. Um, and you, you, know, you just need to pick your client list. So get your top ten clients, pick up the phone, speak to the CEO, find them on Twitter, find them on LinkedIn, call them, face-to-face -face meeting if it's possible, if not Skype. Face-to-face -face is much better though. And ask for a, a commitment. And even if they're paying you next to nothing, like take a financial, always never do it for free, take a financial figure, Run it for three months on a, you know, it could be just a straight tenancy basis of $300, but just put the financials down and get that running. And if that works, you, you, you're off to a good start. Because you've got, even on your website, you've got clients. You know, it's, it's validated. Thanks. Thanks. You're an actress and you're doing a one woman show in Manhattan. Nobody knows you. And you send out multiple press releases. And no one picks picks it up. It's it's not it's nowhere. So it's an event in Manhattan, and you're new to market, and no one knows of you. You've got no fans, and you're trying to get yourself. You're trying to get brand aware, basically. Just trying to get a listing. So, yeah, it's tricky. I you're my you're my you're my perfect customer. Um, it's easy. One of our clients is a beef is passion of ether. They have a brand. They have an email database to die for, an SMS base to die for, and they, they spend, I don't even want to know how much David Guetta gets paid in terms of DJing one night, probably $300,000 for a single night. So everything's just great for him and that, and, that, and, that, and that business. But for someone like yourself, if you were doing a single event in Manhattan, you've got nothing to work with and you're starting at the bottom. The problem with PR lists, I use them, but press release go to editors. Editors have to decide whether they do or don't talk about you, and they're getting a million things going on at once. So you, you become, it's almost like a partner. You're dependent on someone that's not invested in you. Um, it's the difference with putting your event, our business isn't to it. We don't distribute the information out and sit back and go, we've done you a great, we, we get it live. So when we, dist, when we take your event in, we distribute it, we put it live on the listing site, and we list that live link in the report. So you're looking at you know, 50, 60, 70 pages physically live. So we remove the editor, we remove the decision maker, it goes live, and you're already in front of the consumer. So the consumer, acts, it's down to whether the consumer's looking. And I think when it comes to consumers looking for things to do, I don't think, I'm, I'm in New York at the moment, I'm not looking for Mike Epps, a specific comedian in New York, I'm probably just looking for comedy in New York. I'm looking for a comedian in New York. I'm looking for, I'm looking for, it's, for me, if, if I was in a position of a brand new artist looking to market my event, I'd specifically be focusing on the content I write, the title, the description, the information around how amazing this comedy night is. Um, event would get you onto 60, 70, 80 sites. It would be actively live in front of an audience that's looking in the comedy section on the right site. And as long as there's a consumer audience in Manhattan, Looking for, a, looking for a comedy night, then they'll find that event. And that's the kid's critical part. Um, if I was to give you any advice, I'd probably suggest doing it around val uh, Valentine's. Uh, what I know about comedy is uh, men forget to think about doing something nice for their, uh, for their spouses around Valentine's, and they panic by comedy. I've seen it on all of our reports. They panic by comedy uh, the day before. So if you're thinking of launching your first ever comedy gig, do it on Valentine's Day. Yeah, it'll be a full house. It's not that theatrical. A one-woman show. It's not really... It's more theatrical, you know. Well, I think it's, it comes down to great content onto the relevant sites. And it's consistency. I think if, you, if it was a show... Uh, you, you can't just do one night. It's like anything... I think you'd have to commit to a Thursday... It's got to be you know, a regular thing. You have to build up a customer audience. And the other thing is, you know, it's just basic, but if, you were, if anyone that turns up to your event, you put out those cards on the table, you get the email address, and you start to build a, uh, a fan base. You, know, you are marketing, 
if people turn up, you, you did a good job. And even if it's small to start with, you get their email address and you let them know. And if they had a good night the first time and you let them know, they'll come again. So if people turned up, it was just that there was no, there was no listing anywhere. That's what really... Well, we do. That's, that's exactly what we do. You, you could, if today, you could manually go onto the web and find listing sites. In. There's around 76, maybe 82 listing sites for comedy, the comedy category, comedy site in New York. You could go and manually list them all there. Uh, but it's a combination of being on all the sites and running the event week on week on week mm -hmm. for a number of weeks to get uh, a, a trend, I think. Okay, thank you. Well, best of luck. Anyone else? Questions? What's your pricing model like? Can I get you to use the mic? Sure. Oh, sorry, just for the recording. I know the room can hear you, but for those millions of viewers on YouTube. How is your pricing model structured? I made it up. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the model that I made it up on. Because I didn't know. What, I, didn't know. I, I, I kind of wrote down what it costs to do what we do. True. And I thought, how do I price this? Because I don't know. It doesn't exist. Um, I came to a decision. I said, listen. The pitch is going to be really simple. For the same time it takes to put your event to Facebook and save you three hours and get you on to, I don't know, 50 listing sites, 40 million audience, 20 to 35 mobile apps, probably 400,000 people locally. What do I charge for that? And I would ask the, 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 the venue owner and the other promoters, how much does it cost for a single person to turn up? And they'd go, 20 bucks or 50 conferencing, $800. But in, in the UK market, it was about £20, about $30. So I said, OK, OK, $30, $30 it is. And what we did with the local venues is they were running about three to four nights a week. So we would take that three to four nights, 10, 15 events times 30 bucks, and that would be the subscription cost for the month. So $300, $400 was the cost for a subscription package to use the platform. And the pitch is like, you know, all of this, including Google, including all this reach, all I've got to do is get you one person to come. And I don't know many people that go out on a night out on their own. So there's going to be someone else coming. And if they get them through the door at 10 bucks or 20 bucks a ticket, they've got a drink at the bar, there's a food and beverage piece, there's a whole experience piece. Comedy, on average, a comedy per, someone going to a comedy event spends around $80. And they normally go in fours. This is what you learn. You, know, you learn these things. So, so for someone, for, for a comedy club, 30 bucks was nothing. But you have to kind of get to know, that's what I mean, I, we could have gone going, this is, gonna, this is $300, but I think that the starting point for our journey was to figure out uh, a price point that made sense. We, we, you know, we, we move the pricing when we start to see there's more value in the market. The conference market, it's a very similar product, usually different price point, uh, but it's because the conference market, uh, pre, you know, they, have a different, they have a different budget. So our pricing is different by comedy, by pubs, by live, by country. So it's, it's, the question on pricing day one as a, as, a, as a new guy to market, if you're thinking about launching a product, it's not important how much you charge, in my opinion, as long as you charge something, because time is worth, your time is worth something. Once you understand your customer, comedy, value of spend, number of people that go, once you understand, then you can negotiate the price, because the, client, the guy is interested at that point. And I think that's, that's where we, our pricing algorithm today has a discounting model based on different markets. India's different to US, US to Europe, Europe to Asia. Um, category, category affects it, and also the amount of publishers that you, we get you to affects it. So it's highly complex, but it's three years in. Day one, it was, how much is, how much is it for one person through the door? Governor, that was kind of the, the, the question. Uh, the res whatever the response was, we said, right, let's, let's take that price point, times it by the amount of events, give me a three-month trial, and... If it, if it works, let's talk again. And then at that point, we negotiated. So. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I think that we are complete. Uh, before we go, I wanted to be sure and thank uh, our wonderful sponsors. And um, I always start with uh, the great folks here at Overin, uh, because without uh, Dan more providing the venue, we wouldn't have a place to go. Um, uh, I'm excited that... Um, our uh, food and beverage sponsor, uh, Bob Manancier, is here from Infocus France <laughs> and IFP Fields. Uh, Bob is also going to be one of our guests on the roster. I'm really kind of excited. We've got alum. We've got Heather Dwyer, who was, um, uh, was our guest for last month. And um, we've got Kim. 
Burr, yeah, no, Kiss. Kim Frederick is also going to be uh, one of our guests uh, coming up in uh, in the coming months. So, um, just wanted to just thank uh, my awesome film crew, uh, the newest imprints who uh, record for us, and of course Paul Hooks, uh, Paul Hook who makes it um, my man on the floor who makes everything awesome. Um, I wanted to let you know we've got Paul mentioned that in March we've actually got two events um, that are coming up. Uh, I'm really excited. We've got Philip Schwartz from the Omni Business Review, who's going to be one of our guests. Um, but who, who in this room knows who Guy Kawasaki is? Anyone? Guy Kawasaki, one in the back. So Guy Kawasaki is the leading uh, SEO social marketer uh, pretty much in the world. He's got about 100 million followers, so he, he kind of knows what he's talking about. Um, so he actually is going to be interviewed in our California, our, our, by our headquarters. So our, Derek Anderson, who's our founder, will be interviewing Guy Kawasaki. And because he is such an awesome guest, they're going to make it possible for us to stream that. So we're going to be doing two things on March the 18th. We're going to have a lunchtime webinar. So if you have the ability to tune in uh, and catch that webinar at work, you can do that. It's 9.30 a.m. their time, about 12.30 for us. But then we're also going to have that um, a time-adjusted live stream here. So we're going to be streaming that event. So you'll have the opportunity <coughs> to hear from Guy Kawasaki, and that's on the 18th. Um, so we, you, know, you can go to the website, and you can sign up for both of those. I'm probably going to do some sort of a two-for-one since we have two events. Um, but if you have not signed up, uh, subscribe to the website. Please do that, and that way you'll know about all the upcoming events. But um, Richard... I just, I'm almost without words. I'm just so happy. You are without words. I know, that's like <laughs> you know, without voice and without words. But, you know, I just really want to thank you again for My pleasure. Uh, just taking the time. It's been awesome to have you and I uh, look forward to having you again. I'm going to just put that out there and um, I know you've got some exciting things um, and folks can sign up on, you've got some cards, folks can absolutely sign up. It's been a pleasure to come uh, and say hello. And find out uh, what's going on and keep up with your company. So thank you. Thank you. So, okay. I'm not even going to have a voice of honor. That's good.